Good evening. My name is Stephen, and I'm glad to be with you here today. This is my spot where I work from home. It's also a spot where I do research and study. Here I can learn all kinds of things. And tonight, though, this is where it is that I'm going to share with you a message. It is a message expressing God's grace and how God feels about you. There certainly is no one perfect among us. Why, we all sin and are imperfect. We all fall short of the glory of God. Tonight, I'm going to share with you a story. I just know that God is going to do something in someone's heart because this story helps you to see how God feels about you which impels us to do more for God. Enjoy. On March 22, 1824, an incident known as the Fall Creek Massacre took place in Madison County, Indiana. Six white men murdered nine American uh, Native Americans from the Seneca and Miami tribes and wounded another. Among the nine dead were three women and four children. The six men were arrested. They were tried and they were sentenced to death. One of the men, a young man named John Bridge Jr., was sentenced to die by hanging for his part in the massacre. His execution date was set for June 3rd, 1825. His father, John Bridge Sr., and his uncle, Andrew Sawyer, were also to die on the same day. The other three men had already previously been executed. As a large crowd to witness, gathered to witness this execution, now you can imagine that day, they were expecting the governor to pardon those that were accused based on the happenings of the incident itself. With no sign of pardon though, however, a sermon was preached and the crowd listened and waited expectantly. John Bridge Jr., along with the others, watched as his father and his uncle were hanged before him. Finally, John Bridge Jr. was led to the gallows, this junior boy, and the rope was lowered over his head. As the hangman waited for a signal, a cheer arose from the back of the crowd. A stranger rode forward and looked this young junior boy, condemned man, in the face. And this is what he said. He said, uh, Mr. Bridge, Junior, you know in whose presence you stand. And Bridge shook his head. No, 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 sir, I do not know you. So the stranger said, there are two powers known to the law that can save you from a hanging by the neck until you are dead, 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 dead. And one is the great God of the universe. And the other, he said, is J. Brown Ray, governor of the state of Indiana, the latter is the one that stands before you. As the governor hands the hangman a written pardon, the governor says, you boy, you sir, you, you are pardoned. And in an instant, what appeared to be a hopeless situation for the man or boy became a door of hope. John Bridge Jr. went back home and he settled down 
He opened a dry goods store, and he died peacefully 51 years later. I told that story for a few reasons. Can you imagine the fear that must have gripped the heart of that young man as he watched his father and his uncle die, knowing that he was next? Can you imagine the terror as he was led onto the gallows and that noose was placed around his neck? It must have been a moment of terror, the kind of terror that few of us have ever experienced, really. But what a terrible event. What a terrible event this, this was. So we come to our Bible text today. Because the kind of emotions felt by that junior boy was felt by an individual that we're going to read about in the Bible. This individual leads us to a story about Christ and how he reacts to sin, which is so often different than how we ourselves react today. Today's text is taken from John chapter 8, and we're going to begin reading in verse 1. If you have your Bible, you're welcome to follow along with me there. Our text will tell us about a woman who knew just how John Bridge Jr. must have felt who did this terrible thing. This guilty woman, whose story is related in our Bible text, is led to Jesus, and she knew that kind of fear. She is brought trembling into the presence of Jesus, and she knows in her heart that she is about to be stoned to death. Let's begin reading in John chapter 8 and verse 1. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her and when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery, in the very act. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus, Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself, and he said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No, man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. John chapter 8, beginning in verses 1. What a story. When this woman met Jesus, her life changed forever. Her sin was forgiven. Her guilt was removed. Her fear was turned to peace. What appeared to be a hopeless case suddenly became a time of forgiveness. Salvation, joy, and I want to examine 
the case of the guilty woman today. I want to examine that in your heart. The case of the guilty today. So let's imagine the scene for a moment. It is very early in the morning. Jesus is sitting in the temple. This crowd has gathered around as we see in our texts. And he teaches them the word of God. It is a scene of peace and tranquility. Suddenly, the quiet is shattered by the din of an approaching crowd, and an angry male is heard voicing and shouting his thoughts. There is the sound of a struggle. With a trembling voice, a woman, a woman cries out for mercy, please. In the next moment, the crowd reaches Jesus. And this, this, this broken, this disheveled, weeping woman is thrown down at his feet. And her accusers launch into their attack against her. They claim to have caught her engaged in a vile sin. They bring her to Jesus and they demand that, that he answer a few simple questions about this. We caught this woman, they said, in the act of committing adultery. The law of God says this woman should be stoned to death. It makes sense to them. Jesus, what do you say about this woman and her sin? This poor woman's story is going to speak to you today. It's going to teach you that no sinner is too far gone for God. It teaches us that no one's guilt is too deep. And that if you've ever felt like everyone else has given up on you. It teaches us that no one is beyond the reach of God's grace. This is a story of hope. This is a story of hope in the midst of a hopeless time. Notice with me the facts of her story, the facts of her story that teach us about the marvelous grace of God as we consider this guilty woman's case. The woman's sin and her guilt. This woman was caught, as the text verses read, in the very act of adultery. Evidently, this, this woman was betrothed to be married or she was engaged. I say it because those who were found guilty of adultery were stoned if they were engaged. They were stoned while married women were strangled in those times. She was caught having a sexual relation with a man, and uh, she was not engaged to him. She was guilty of a terrible sin. Now, there was no doubt about it. Uh, there was no doubt about what she did. Everybody, everybody knew it. Her guilt is beyond question. She did it. It, uh, it broke God's law. It violated marriage uh, vows. It, it breaks hearts, adultery. It destroys, it destroys families. It cheapens uh, sex. It destroys trust. It shatters dreams. It's horrible and evil and it's inexcusable. It should never happen. It should never, ever happen. But it does. But it does. It should never happen. But it happened here. The sinner was the woman. It happened. And as horrible as the sin of adultery is, 
it is no worse in the eyes of God than any other sin. James chapter 2 and verse 10. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the Some law. Some sins carry greater consequences than others. For instance, adultery can destroy your marriage. Uh, you, you might acquire a sexually transmitted disease or a, multiple, uh, a multitude of other terrible things could happen. Contrast that with someone who takes a piece of candy from a store without paying for it. It happens. It happens. And no one but God and the shoplifter know anything about it. It could be a secret. It could be your secret. We look at those sins and we think they are worlds apart while they do carry vastly different consequences. If the sinner gets caught in God's eyes, they're the same thing. They're the same thing. They are both sin. Sin, that's what they are. And regardless of how large or large or small you think that it is, it's a reflection of the depravity that exists within the human heart. In fact, even if we could somehow live our whole lives without committing a single sin with our bodies or in our minds, we would still stand guilty as sinners before the Lord. Romans chapter 3 and verses 10 through 18, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. And with their tongues they have used deceit. Their poison of asps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness? Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 22, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Each of us is just as guilty as that adulterous woman. Each of us. Our problem is that we simply, sometimes we, we just, uh, we don't want to admit it. And admitting that we are a sinner is the first step toward finding forgiveness. I'm going to say that one more time. Admitting that we are sinners and that we fall short of the glory of God is the first step toward finding forgiveness and feeling God's ever-reaching grace. Each of us is just as guilty as this adulterous woman this is one part of the message where I'd like you to reach deep into your heart. I'd like you to understand how she may have felt. I want to ask you to examine yourself to see if perhaps you have felt this shame yourself. This poor woman was grabbed up from the place where she was engaged in adultery. She was grabbed up. I'm not sure how that happened. But she... They came in upon her and grabbed her up and in their haste to bring this woman to Jesus. Her accusers may not have given her 
a very much time, I'm sure there was a scene. She probably didn't get properly dressed. She was exposed physically, and she was humiliated. Beyond that, her true spiritual condition is exposed for everyone to see. Everyone knows what she is and what she did. She is brought to public shame. I wonder if she saw just how shameful her sin was in the eyes of the Lord. Sin Sin is a shameful thing. It is shameful when it is committed. It is shameful when it is a sin of the heart. It is shameful when it is a sin in the flesh. It is shameful when it is done in the open and sin. It is shameful when it is done in secret. The sinner will always be brought to shame if not before other people. Surely, surely before the Lord. No matter how skillful sin it's hidden from the eyes of God, Jesus knows about it. Jesus knows about it. Proverbs 15.3, The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil, the evil and the good. One day, hidden sin will be revealed for all to see. That is the Lord's clear statement. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 3, Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And Numbers chapter 32 and verse 23. And be sure your sin will find you out. One day, one day, one day even the true state of a sinner's heart is going to be revealed. One day it's going to happen. The truth, the truth about your profession will also be made public. And so it is in truth that Matthew chapter 7 highlights those who will say in that day, Lord, didn't we do all these things for you? Didn't we prophesy, cast out devils or demons and, and do one wonderful works? And then in the end, he says, I never knew you depart from me ye that work iniquity. It's true. One day, even the true state of a sinner's heart will be revealed. So here we are. We all find ourselves in this, this state where we've, we fall short of God's glory. So she was guilty. Her sentence, it was fair. The men who accused her, they were right. She deserved to die. The law of God, of Moses, said so. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. The law of Moses, Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 10. It was clear she deserved to die. If a man be found lying with a woman married to a husband and they, and they shall both of them die, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman shall be Put away from evil from Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 22. Law of Moses. Clear. She deserved to die. Adulterous women who were betrothed were stoned to death. 
They were stoned to death. Married women were strangled. And if the woman was the daughter of a priest, she was to be burned to death. Wow. Sound extreme to you? These types of executions sound harsh to us. But they were instituted to protect the sanctity of sex, the holiness of marriage, and the moral purity of the nation of Israel. Of course, there was a little problem with their acquisition. Where was her partner? Where was her partner? Both were supposed to die for their sin. The man may have been part of this scheme to attack Jesus. He may have been allowed to slip away. Regardless of where the man was, the woman, uh, she was guilty. And uh, she deserved to die. You read it. It's the law of Moses. Again, there is a lesson here for us. Nobody gets away. Uh, nobody gets away with it. Nobody gets away with sin. Sin demands a price and the payment always comes due the payment always so the Bible the Bible says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord if you are not saved you, you need you need to know it you need to know it if you're not saved. You need to know that there's going to be a payday associated with sin. The ultimate price will be paid when you die. And if you die without Jesus, if you die without Jesus, you can imagine that. You know what that means. From there, you will one day stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and be cast into what the Bible calls a lake of fire. The Bible calls that a second death, and that is the future of every lost soul. That's what they face. That's what they face. That is the future of every lost soul. That's what they face. So the only hope any sinner has is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only hope anyone has in the world or anyone to come. Jesus is the only way. It's the only and way. And so John chapter 14 and verse 6, a familiar verse and text where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's it. It's the only way. So we've read all the verses and we know where the woman stands. She's trapped. What can she do? She can't, she can't deny that it happened. She can't deny it. No, it happened. She's guilty. She was caught in the very act of adultery. How could she plead her case? The law condemned her. The law already condemned her. The crowd condemned her. The religious establishment of the day condemned her. No one would speak for this woman. But while she didn't know it yet, she had found one who would stoop for her, as the text reads. Oh, the foolish of these scribes and Pharisees, in their effort to humiliate the woman, and to discredit our Lord Jesus. They brought her to the best possible place. They brought her to the very man who could deal with her sins in grace and forgiveness. They brought her to the one man who could save her soul. I just want to remind you all the guilty sinners, all of us, and you watching, that Jesus loves you and he cares about you. He is the sinner's friend. In his day, Jesus was known to hang out with people just like you, to hang out with notorious sinners. 
Jesus isn't concerned about his reputation. He's only concerned with one thing. He's concerned about your soul and he loves you. And I want you to know that before we continue. So we talked about her. We talked about her sin. We, we talked about the expectation of a stoning. But let's talk about the solicitors in this case, these religious legalists that were trying to pin Jesus on the horns of this dilemma. If Jesus let the woman go without condemning her sin, he would be seen as being easy on sin. He could be labeled a compromiser. He, he, could, have, he could have been arrested for violating the law itself. On the other hand, uh, if he endorsed the stoning of the woman, he could then be accused before Rome as an upstart and a seditionist. Uh, and he would have destroyed his reputation as being the friend, the friend of publicans and sinners. They felt that no matter what Jesus said, he had no wiggle room. They, ha they had him. He had, uh, he had no wiggle room to react. And it was a setup. It was a setup. They attempted to trap him in an effort to get rid of him. Either they could discredit him with the people, with Rome, or, or in his relationship to the law. And this brings to mind a, a, a couple of questions. Uh, how did they do it? Did they witness a suggestive glance between two people and follow them to try and catch this woman in adultery? How did this happen? Did they orchestrate the adultery uh, simply as a means to destroy Jesus? Uh, if they did, this would explain the lack of an accused male. The man could very well have been one, one of their numbers. Could have been one of them. How many were so, so men able to witness such a lurid and how were they able to do it, to witness this obscene situation? Where was their compassion? for this woman. It's sad, it is sad, that they would use this woman to achieve a selfish goal against Jesus with no regard for the condition of her soul. It's obvious that she needed help. It's obvious that she needed a change and they cared only about destroying Jesus and his work. I just want you to know that nothing has, has really has really changed. Uh, religious leaders uh, are the same, many of them. They don't in that day they didn't care about the woman, her sin, her soul, or her eternal destiny. They cared nothing about right or wrong. They had an agenda, attacking their enemy and promoting their brand of righteousness. Pharisees. Pharisees are the same. Their scheme might have succeeded. They might have been able to do it. Had they tried it with someone else, maybe somebody different. Maybe if they'd schemed a different person, but, but Jesus, they were dealing with the Lord Jesus Christ and he refused to play into their rules. When they attacked Jesus, they came against a man who knew what was in their hearts. And notice how he responded. I want you to focus on this as we come towards the end of our discussion. I want you to notice how Jesus responded to them. Well, you read the text. While they were talking to the Lord, asking his opinion about the woman, her adultery, and the demands of the law, and this discussion ensued, Jesus, Jesus did something strange. Uh, he knelt down and began to write on the ground. I imagine he took his finger and he's writing, he's writing in the ground, in the dirt. This is the only time we have a record of Jesus writing anything, anything during his earthly life. 
This is the only time that we have a record of our Savior writing anything during his earthly life. What does it mean? The question that has plagued the minds of Bible students for 2,000 years. What did it mean? What did Jesus write when he wrote with his finger on the ground? As I said, many people have put forth many possible answers to the question. I'm going to give you a, today a deep, a deep theological answer to this. I don't know. I don't know. Nobody knows. I don't know what Jesus wrote and neither does anyone else. But I can tell you with certainty what Jesus wrote. Well, I can't tell you uh, with certainty what he wrote. I can give you some things to think about. And I hope you do it. Because God's going to do something wonderful with this message. If you apply this into your own heart and into your own life. God's going to talk to somebody. Perhaps Jesus was reliving the moment when his finger first touched the dirt. On that occasion, he formed a man from the dirt and breathed into him the breath of life. Perhaps he was reflecting on how far the human race had fallen from that lofty beginning. A woman guilty of adultery, a crowd of men who claimed to love God but who had no love for a sinner. It must have broken his heart. Still does. Perhaps he wrote the Ten Commandments in the dirt. After all, it was a finger that wrote them in stone. They were given to Moses. He wrote these words there in the dust, maybe. These words would be trampled underfoot in just a short time when he gave Israel the commandments in Exodus chapter 32. It only took a short time before they were trampled underfoot. Could be. Perhaps he wrote their names in fulfillment of John 17, 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Maybe it's what he was writing. I don't know. I don't know what Jesus was writing in the dirt. Maybe uh, maybe he was writing the names of their girlfriends in the sand. I don't know. <laughs> maybe he was simply ignoring them. Maybe that's the case. It's the most likely explanation for the Lord's actions. When someone speaks to us and we busy ourselves doing something else, it signifies that we do not esteem that person of being worthy of our attention. Most likely that's the case. This truly is a powerful story uh, in the Bible. It is motivating to our hearts. As we reach into our hearts and make comparisons of where we stand when it comes to God. Whatever the Lord wrote on the ground that day, it arrested their attention. This action. They were, they were all convicted by his words. They dropped their rocks. They demanded justice and they, they left. By the way, he knows how to speak to our hearts too doesn't he? Do you feel like God is speaking to you? I know that God's going to do a work here in someone's heart. What Jesus revealed about them, think about this. When Jesus did speak, he said, he that is without sin among, 
let him first cast a stone at her. He stood back and he said, Stone her, but let the man without sin be the one to cast the first stone. Jesus wasn't requiring that these accusers be sinless. No. Jesus wasn't requiring that these accusers be sinless. If that was the case, then no human would ever be able to render judgment in any matter, even in a court of law. When the Jews carried out an execution of this sort, they took the accused to a high scaffold they had built over a pit. The law required two witnesses to convict a person of a crime punishable by death. The accused and the two witnesses mounted the scaffold. One witness was required to push the accused off the scaffold into the pit. If the fall killed the accused, the execution was over. That's it. Be done. If they survived the fall, then the other witness was required to cast a stone called called the stone of finishing. It was called the stone of finishing onto the chest of the accused if the accused survived that. The others attending the execution would take up stones and they would finish killing the accused. This was done to underscore the seriousness of making accusations against others. So the Jews demanded that one of the accusers cast the first stone, Deuteronomy 17, 7, the finishing stone. The stone was supposed to be thrown first to stun the victim before the rest of the stones began to fall. I think what Jesus may have been trying to say to these hypocrites was, he that is free from this particular sin, let him first cast a stone at her. Adultery was rampant then. It was rampant. In that society, Jesus said as much when he called that generation an adulterous generation in Matthew chapter 12. In fact, God had long ago instituted a means for a jealous husband to determine whether or not his wife was guilty of adultery. The test was called the law of the waters of jealousy found in Numbers chapter 5. If the wife was guilty, she would die. If she lived, she was innocent. However, if the husband was guilty, the test wouldn't work at all. By Christ's day, adultery was so prevalent that the test had been abandoned. These men were guilty. These same, these same men, and Jesus knew it. He knew their guilt. Jesus spoke. And then what did he do? He stooped. He stooped. He stooped again. Here's the takeaway from this thought. And I hope you give this a, you, you really think about this. Uh, adultery can be committed with the heart just as surely as it may be committed with the body. Adultery can be committed with the heart just like it can be committed with the body. At this point, all the shouting came to a stop. And all that could be heard was the dropping of the rocks and the shuffle of the sandals as they quietly slipped away. Imagine that moment. These men had been exposed before their fellow man, the accused lady, and most importantly, before the Lord. My dear wow. friends, before we leave, I want you to meditate for a minute. We, sh we should at least give these men credit for the fact that when they saw themselves as they really were, they stopped calling for the death of the woman. They stopped. Jesus had gotten to them. He touched them. And I want you to know the, that one of the hardest things you will ever do is see yourself as you really are.
When you do see yourself as you are, you're going to be in a place to do something about it. The Apostle Paul would have died in his sins had he not been made to face himself on that road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. If you'll let me, I want to backtrack for a moment. As I mentioned a moment ago, we will never know this side of heaven just what Jesus wrote on the ground that day. And guess what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what was written. What matters is the statement in verse 6. But Jesus stooped down. Jesus stooped down. That's what he does. That's what he does, man. Jesus stoops down. When he stooped that day, he descended below the scribes and the Pharisees. When he stooped down, he, he descended below the disciples. He descended below the crowds that had gathered in the temple. He even descended below the guilty woman standing before him. Her accusers had to look down to see her. Now they had to look even lower to see Jesus. Stooping was not a new thing for Jesus. He often stooped during his ministry. He stooped to wash the feet of his disciples. You know he did. You remember the stories he stooped to teach, to touch a poor leper. He stooped to embrace little children. He stooped to catch Peter when he was sinking in the waves. He stooped to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. He stooped to allow the Roman soldiers to beat him with a cat of nine nails. He stooped to carry his cross to the cavalry. He stooped. He stooped right here to write in the dirt. His stooping is a picture of his grace. Do not forget how the Lord extended grace to this sinful woman. When Jesus stooped here, he stooped for her. When he stood up, he stood up for her. But my friends, this story doesn't end here. How did Jesus confront this woman? How does Jesus confront you? In this case, when the last rock hit the temple floor, Jesus stood up and faced her. And standing there before her, he was the only one there. And he was the only one the world has ever known who was qualified to take up those stones and execute her for her sins. When she faced Jesus, she was facing the judge. When she was facing Jesus, she was facing the judge. She came to a place where life came down to just Jesus and her. By the way, it always comes down to that, doesn't it? Eventually, somewhere, someday, you're going to have to face Jesus. Eventually, somewhere, someday, you're going to have to bow down to him. I'm sure that he has given you many opportunities to do it in this life to come to him. What have you done with those opportunities, my friends? You will either bow down to Jesus Christ here when you come face to face with him or, or you will bow down to him when you face him on judgment day what is it going to be for you in the end it always comes down to just you and Jesus and what you do with him will determine where and how you spend eternity simple that's it so true 
So, my friends, Jesus cleanses her. The only one qualified to throw a stone refuses to. Imagine it. Jesus dealt with her on the basis of mercy and grace. She deserved judgment, but he gave her forgiveness. Those religious men condemned her and said she was worthy of death. Jesus, Jesus saw someone who was worthy of his love. He saw someone worth saving. Jesus looked at that guilty woman. Jesus looked at that guilty woman and said, Woman, where are thou those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? His question is this. Are there any witnesses against you? Has anyone passed sentence on you? And she says, No man, Lord. And his forgiveness is instant. Neither do I condemn thee. When this woman looked to Jesus by faith and received the grace he offered to her, her salvation was instantaneous. That's how it works for you. That's how it works for us. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It doesn't get any easier than that. It doesn't. Even small children can comprehend the truth, that truth, make it real in their lives. Have we taken this step of faith? What about us? Everyone who comes to Jesus by faith receives forgiveness for all their sins and absolute liberation from all condemnation. It doesn't mean that a Christian doesn't continue to work. So we always want to be on the side of our Lord. That's how it works. Beloved, that is, that is shouting ground. That is earth-shattering news. Everyone who comes to Jesus by faith receives forgiveness for all their sins. When Jesus cleansed her, he said, go and sin no more. All of her life, this woman had been subject to Satan. She had been a prisoner of her lusts and desires. Jesus came to her and unlocked the shackles that bound her to her sin, and he set her free. Wow. It's amazing how her life must have changed. Think of her years later as she looks at her children and her husband, a family she would have never had if she hadn't met Jesus. Think of the other families that were spared the pain of her adulteries. Jesus specializes in taking wasted ruined lives and saving them by his grace and restoring them to usefulness. Every person who comes to Jesus for salvation receives a new life. Every person. In verse 10, Jesus called her woman. Verse 10. He only used this term twice in the Gospel of John. Only twice in the Gospel of John. Once in chapter 2, and again in chapter 19. Both times it was a little, uh, it was a title of honor applied to his mother Mary. It would be equivalent to the term lady. It was a term of honor given to a woman worthy of honor. Can you imagine that moment? Woman, Jesus said. My friends, this woman was anything but a lady. Jesus has a way of seeing things that, that are not as though they were. In other words, he did not see this woman as she was. He saw her as she could become through him. Jesus took a wicked, godless, carnal, sinful woman and turned her. 
to a lady. When Jesus looks at a life, he sees a person as they can become through faith in him. And just so you know, your life does not have to remain like it is right now. It doesn't. It could be better. It could be new. It can be pleasing to the Lord, but only if you come to Jesus. You got to do it. You got to come to I'm going to end this soon. But I want to ask you, how was this all made possible? Why did the accusers drop their stones and leave the temple? Why was the Lord able to forgive this sinful woman? Why is he able to offer people like us his grace and his salvation? Why? Why can he do this? How did this happen? He is able to do all of that and more because he stooped. And I want you to think about it. He stooped to be born in a manger. He stooped to live in poverty. He stooped to work as a carpenter. He stooped to eat as sinners with sinners. He stooped to be hungry, tired, and thirsty. He stooped to sleep in a boat. He stooped to sit on a well. He stooped to spend time with tax collectors. He stooped to touch lepers. He stooped to be beaten. He stooped to be spit upon. He stooped to be ridiculed and mocked. He stooped to be nailed to a cross. He stooped to be crucified. He stooped to bear our sins in his own body. He stooped to die. And then he stooped to be buried. And three days later, hallelujah, he stood up. And when he did, everything changed. When he stooped and stood up, sin, death, hell, Satan, and the grave were all defeated. Praise the Lord. Our God is the God who stoops and then stands. When Jesus stooped and stood up in the temple, a woman was set free from sin and death. It happened. When Jesus sto stooped to die and stood up three days later, he delivered his people from their sins. And I say, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Changes lives. This could change yours. And in conclusion, my dear friends, at a special chapel service in an Ohio penitentiary, the governor was a, to grant freedom to several convicts. The suspense mounted as it came time for the governor to announce the names of those he'd selected. Reuben Johnson, come forward and receive your pardon. No one responded in the group. The chaplain directed his attention toward Johnson, specifically toward Johnson, and he said, Reuben, it's you, man. Come on. And the man looked behind him supposing there must be someone else by that name. Then pointing directly at him, the chaplain said, that's right, you're the man. There was a long pause. He slowly approached the governor to receive a letter of pardon. Later, when the other prisoners marched to their cells, Johnson fell in line and began to walk with them still. The warden said, Reuben, Reuben, man, you don't belong there anymore. You're a free man. I just want you to know that your life does not have to be lived out in the prison house of sin. You do not have to be a slave to your passions. You do not have to die. You can live. 
the Lord of glory, Jesus Christ himself, stooped for you. He came to this world and died that you might live. He came to set you free. He is able to deliver you from the sins that torment you. He is able to deliver you from dead religion. He is able to give you a new life. All you need to do is accept His grace, just like this woman did. And when you do, Jesus stands up for you, and salvation will be the result. That's it. That's my message. Are you lost in sin? Come to Jesus, be saved. Are you saved by grace? Come to Jesus, give, give him long and sustained praise for his grace in your life. And that's my message. I want to thank you for joining us this evening. And we'll be posting messages throughout our COVID stay away from church. We've had some difficulties there. We miss all of you. We love you. And we're deeply praying for you. Dear God, please be with all of us through this difficult time. May this message reach our hearts. Speak to us, dear God. And in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, my friends. And we'll see you again soon. Have a great evening.